Welcome to The Gravel Lot, the place where bikes are for everyone. The Gravel Lot podcast is presented by Be Free Ride Bikes Apparel, providing a fully customized cycling apparel experience to provide you and your team the attention to detail and personal touch that you deserve. 
and also brought to you by Grimpoor Brothers Coffee, offering handmade coffee roasted weekly in small batches to give you the finest quality coffee to start your day. Choose their subscription service and earn your free bag of coffee today. And by Hand Up Gloves. Great gear, better times. Providing a wide range of apparel for bikes, snow sports, and golf in multiple designs and fits to let your personality shine. Our goal with the Gravel Lot is to inspire cyclists of all stripes to ride bikes, share their story, and have fun. We love all bikes and anyone who wants to ride them. So no matter where you sit on the spectrum of bikes, we'll always have a place for you in the Gravel Lot. And now, the hosts of TGL, John Woolery and Doug McClintock. Hello and welcome back to the Gravel Lot. I'm John, that's Doug, and we are so, so glad that you guys found us once again. If it's your first time, welcome to the Gravel Lot. If it's your 100th time, welcome back. Thank you for You're continuing, a yeah, continuing You're a to tune in um, for dealing with us and and just continuing to like subject yourself to this. So like, thanks. Um, so for those of you that are new uh, in the Gravel Lot, we fully believe that there is only one thing better than the beauty of a bike ride and that is sharing a bike ride with your friends and whether they're new friends old friends whatever so um it's also like a great place to tell stories and kind of trade life and and talk about life and talk about the things that happened in your day so that's kind of the genesis of where the show started so like our goal is to dive deep into someone's life and tell stories let them tell stories about themselves we ask questions that we think of along the way and you guys get some great life experiences along the way. So um, we hope you enjoy that. Yeah. If you, if you like what you're hearing uh, today, Pebbles, um, please share it, um, hit the like button, subscribe, follow, engage, do all the things that are important that the internet rewards, um, but share it with your friends and tell them about why you like it and get, point them to some episodes. You know, we've got some stuff. If you've got a favorite episode, point somebody at it. We'd love that. If you are on the live stream today, please leave your comments below. We would love to have those questions, information, any of that would be awesome. Check out our website, um, go to the Etsy store, uh, support TGL on Patreon. Um, that help pay for this acoustic foam that is in uh, the studio, which I am dry firing tonight, which is exciting. Um, and uh, if you have guest suggestions or comments or feedback, do all that. Get in touch with us. You can get in touch with us on all the good social media at the gravel lot. We are uh, at the gravel lot.com. Um, and we have a phone number. If you feel like prank calling us 513-455-77, give us a call and uh, tell us what's on your mind. Yeah. You know, what was really great, Doug. Like, you had a bad day. Unload. Yeah. And, and the cool thing is, is we collect that stuff and then we'll turn it into a show like we did. Last, I was going to say last week, but last show yeah. where it was just you and I answering y'all's questions. And some yeah, of them were really funny and really good. And <laughs> They were real good. And we want more. We want more of yeah, those. Yeah, we want to do more of that. that that's that's yeah. nice because those are those are shows that, that Doug loves that make me very uncomfortable because they're not planned because I generally don't know what's coming. So uh, you can't really good. plan for them. And those make Doug so, so happy. You have no idea when we go on car trips what I'm going to bring up to you. You might have like a rudimentary idea what I need to talk about and what I need yeah. to unload on. But... I'm always going to throw you some fucking curveball. So get Correct. ready. <laughs> yes. So yes. awesome. Um, that leads me perfectly into this week. John, how has the ride been over the past uh, couple of weeks here? Uh, so, <laughs> since, since we recorded the last episode, uh, Doug and I were just talking about this, that, so on the last episode, I talk about how, you know, I'm, I'm, I mean, you guys know that, like, if you guys have been listening, like I'm, I'm the square, like I've never, you're not a square, uh, but, but just, but in terms of like drug life, like never smoked a cigarette, never smoked a drug, drug never done any of that stuff. Um, <laughs> but but since then, like your guys' interactions, you, like the things that either you guys have sent or pointed me in the direction of, or just the things that have come into my world in the last like fourteen days, has been like super comical. It went from like absolutely nothing to like avenues all over the place like three, uh, three of my family allegedly, members have alleged, met alleged, th allegedly, no, no, allegedly three of my family members have medical cards and i didn't know that until like the last couple days and uh, and a client at work sent us packaging what they thought was packaging but i don't think anybody actually took the time to look at it that there was still like 
a gram of this and a gram of that in the packaging. And allegedly, I don't think allegedly. that one has to be allegedly um, because it came from California. And I'm pretty sure that the post office doesn't really want to transport that stuff. It's good that we're putting this on a recording. Whatever. So it's the internet. I'm untouchable. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying who. I'm not saying where. Whatever. It is whatever. what it is. But allegedly. to me, that that is like... My takeaway that it's getting nicer out. We're we're now in daylight savings time, so the days are like a little bit more bright, and the weather's warming up. Um, so but is things my are, horizon things of are, enjoyment. Things are, things are things are heading in the right direction. So um, I think that's that's like my little plug of like doing shows like that are such a blast. It was so much fun to record. It was so fun to go through some of the questions that didn't get asked um, after the show. So like keep that stuff coming because like. That stuff, like, I want to do that stuff more because that show, it's, yeah, it's different for what we normally do, um, but I think it it adds a whole new level of spice to the show. So Agreed. keep that Agreed. coming. That was such a fun freaking time. I had an absolute blast doing it. Um, so thanks to all of y'all who sent us stuff. Um, it was fun to do. Um, I did get some follow-ups. I now know that uh, more about cooking in my dishwasher. So that's a good thing. It's a good thing. I've learned, learned many things. I haven't I tried was, it. But. I was also right about the egg you, you were soft boil an egg i'm pretty proud of egg. that um, but don't hey don't give away that don't give away the cow don't, without wait was it the milk for free which what? way does that go whatever that's saying know. about the cow and the milk for free don't, don't do that go listen to last last week's episode i'm bad, I'm bad at bartering good. Good. whatever good. take the cow so uh what about you doug you you're you're sitting in Ooh, your dog. ride from, from um, the last two weeks yeah so this has really been the big thing um the studio it exists. Um, I uh, maybe we'll, we'll throw see if we can. Uh, I'll try to get a a good photo of it um, that doesn't have tools littered about it. As I was um, That's running, progress. Uh, That's like as I was running scenes. cat. As I was running cat six, like to the from the router to the um, to the studio, which we have internet. Um, I'm gonna have to see how the wireless works, John. You're gonna have to come over and check that out. But um, yeah, just set the studio up. Um, it's good. The hopefully the sound quality is great. Um, I did some testing of that um, on Sunday when I finally got everything in. Um, I do have an issue with <laughs> um, the acoustic foam staying mounted to it's the a, ceiling. It's a living um, studio. Yeah, it is. It has its own. It is alive. It has a mind of its own. Um, First off, if you did not know, um, Super 77, I think is what it's called, or Super 73 um, 3M uh, adhesive, um, high, very high level VOCs. Like, oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> oh, yeah. Especially in your basement. My, I should I should have had my respirator on to be clear. I yeah. Um, Ellen came down and was like, Jesus, I got to open some windows and start fumigating the house. Um, and you're but, just like, what? I, what? No, I mean. That was the that was the that was not the limiter of my brain <laughs> the point of time when I was doing this. The problem was, um, you know, sticking stuff up above you. And granted, it's foam; it's not going to hurt me. But you've got to really hammer on the adhesive. So, um, I've thought about some other ways I can potentially fix it. Maybe some staples and stuff, just to make sure it stays up. But I will tell you what: um, it is like eerily quiet in the studio, and that's what you want. You want to walk into a room and be like. Okay, this is disturbing. I can't hear anything because when you have your headphones on, you don't, you're not bothered yeah. by that. But like, you yeah. want the quietness, and it works Look, really good. We gotta figure out lights, but we'll get that figured looking, out. Looking forward to being in there. Um, a whole lot. Like having one person in there is is like, it, it is. It's a huge accomplishment to get to this point. But now, when you add me, you add the live stream, you add the additional technology that's going to go in there. There's a lot that still needs to be figured out, and the goal yeah. is is to have it ready for next live stream. So we'll yeah, we'll see. If you're, I guess if you're listening, in the, if you're listening in the future, and you like go to the YouTube page and check our next episode to see if we succeeded, or if you're listening in the now, I guess wait. Just just wait to see what. Just happens. wait. Yeah. <laughs> see if we do it. See if we deliver. It'll be fun. No, we'll get it done. Um, it's I gotta figure. Lighting is gonna be tough, but we'll figure it out. This is a cave. Yes. Um, so we're gonna need lots of figure out Klieg lights and whatnot. Make sure it doesn't get too hot in here. So. Yeah. Thank God for LEDs, or else yes. we'd be dying. So, um, John, I, let's go. I, I think that's kind of the time. Uh, yeah, I think we need to bring our guest in this week. Let's yeah, people have been listening to us talk for two and a half or something weeks now. They don't. They don't need more of us talking. Fantastic. 
it has worked as uh, sometimes it does. And usually let's hopefully it continues to work. If you, uh, our guest this week uh, is absolutely excellent. Um, it's a little different than what we did last week. If you tuned in, we were, we were just answering your questions about um, odd ways to cook things and so on and so forth. But um, we are bringing in the big guns this week. And we have a guest with us who has climbed many a mountain in his personal life. Uh, he's been in the financial industry, corporate America. He's become a multi-time Ironman, um, a writer, an advocate, um, it's an awesome all around uh, cyclist and so many other things. He came into our sphere because of his book, Cycle for Lives. We will put that link in the show notes, um, as you as you always know. Um, but we are going to give him the full TGL treatment. So, David Richmond, welcome to the Gravel Lot. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, John. Glad to be here. Let's talk. Yeah, let's get into it. I, th I think <laughs> there's there's so much that that I'm looking forward to in this because I think I, I know you've done a lot of talks and things like that, and, and you kind of can control your own narrative a little bit. Um, but I always like to have have people come on in this long form and and have it be more of an open ended conversation. And we were already finding ourselves in the green room like, no, 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 no. Hold off. Like, let's not talk about that yet. Let's let's keep the powder dry until we get into it. So I'm, yeah. I'm really excited to, to kind of dig into a lot of your story, but even more mm -hmm. so just the, the why in, in some of your um, in some of your passions and some of your kind of left sure. turns that you've done in life. So sure. So we always like to start the show um, with kind of the origin story of bikes for people, because we think that's important. It's a narrative. We all have a story about how we figured out why bikes were important to us. Were bikes part of your life growing up? Was that a thing that was like a, a through line for you at that point in time? Nope. <laughs> Not even a little bit. He's like, sweet. And moving on to the next. No, you know, my only and I have probably told this story in years, but my only memory of biking as a kid was on my way to middle school, Frisbee in one hand, hands on the bike. And I got sideswiped by a car Whoa. and went flying off the bike. Uh, this was obviously days before helmets into a tree. And Whoa. I got up. I found my Frisbee. I walked the bike back to my house and apparently collapsed on the patio of the house on the porch way back when, when they used to have people that delivered milk, not Amazon, yeah. but the yeah. milkman. Yeah. I mean, apparently Amazon, you're me. correct. It has come full circle. David. <laughs> you are correct. Amazon has decided we will be the milkman of the United States. Yeah. True. So that guy found me on the, on the, on the porch passed out. I might've been, whatever that was 11 or 12 and um yeah my mom came out threw me in the car took me to the hospital and i was there for a few days with a pretty massive concussion and i don't remember ever having bikes a part of my life until the very first time that i said you know i was in my late 30s where i go okay i'm gonna um i think i'm gonna try this triathlon thing huh was it was it that's a, that's a very traumatic incident that is not a thing that like you just shove under the rug and don't think about it's not, it's for not the a next skin knee. Yeah, for the next 20 years. Like I remember I remember racing my sister down the hill at my house and jumping over the little stone fence and breaking my ankle in a rabbit hole. And I did that. That wasn't like a thing that was acted upon me. Right. Did that that incident imprint on you in a way that like kept you away from bikes or do you think that that just was a natural progression that you didn't find them again from? yeah no it was just one other thing and, and i'll tell you what if i really think about it hard it probably uh was one of the little stones in the foundation that says you know bad things happen to good people like you just gotta mm. just deal with it and move on you know that was a that was pretty traumatic but i've had way more traumatic things happen to me and it's like sometimes it's your own doing sometimes it's not but um, whatever, man, you got to make the most of it because you can't control everything that happens to you, right? Yeah. yeah so sure. so let's let's kind of set I, I think set the table a little bit and talk about yeah. your career because I think that that helps to influence a lot of um, just like like you're saying it's laying the bedrock of here's here's where we start here's kind of where you started in in your professional career and then we can start to to take some of the turns so. Um, talk to us about, about college and then about kind of where you started in your career and kind of walk us through the initial parts of that. Sure. Well, it sounds more like a 
fake story, but I'm telling you, it's not a fake story. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I ended up leaving home, not in good circumstances when I was 18 years old and I was happens, getting ready to go. Huh? What's that? It happens. I mean, it happens. It's, it's, it's a more common story than, than a lot of people think. Yeah. And so I'm hitting the world and I'm going to go visit a bunch of uh, colleges that I got accepted into. And unfortunately, my car broke down in Vegas and I didn't have really anybody to call, didn't have anybody, uh, you know, to tell me what to do. So I just tried to figure it out. And I figured it out by getting a stranger, uh, stranger's trust a couple of days later, who then ended up robbing me of everything I had at gunpoint. Oh God. And so, uh, there I was 18 years old, probably maturity level of maybe a 10 year old, uh, streets wise anyway. And, um, yeah, I was homeless, uh, 56 cents in my pocket. I did have a carton of, 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 uh, merit 100s, but, uh, yeah, no, nobody to call nobody, nobody to, to turn to for help and just stuck like, like nowhere to go. So what I did was I, I walked into a fast food restaurant that I worked at as a teenager. I said, you know, a few days later, I said, Hey, I need help. They're like, Whoa, you're not, uh, you're not in good shape. They could tell. And I said, well, I'll call my old manager. I'm a good guy. I just uh, need a job. And I got that and got on my feet. Um, you know, really John, a college was never an option because I wanted to, uh, I needed to put a roof over my head and, protect myself and figure right. out my way in the world. And I just never, I never had an opportunity to go to college. Um, I did have an entrepreneurial streak. And so when I worked at the, you know, the Jack in the box, I became the manager. When I worked at the Tropicana hotel, I became the boss. When I worked at Friday's restaurant, I became the new store opener. And when I, you know, went into doing real estate, I became the lead sales guy. And I just, I just, worked like 10 times harder than everybody else and eventually mm -hmm. uh, landed in financial services and uh, woke up one day running a, you know, $120 million in <laughs> revenue business for a major wall street firm. And uh, always, always afraid to answer the question, where'd you go to college? I, I love, I love <laughs> I, how you oh. answer that just it, from the, like, I just woke up and, and you're like glossing over all of the like early mornings, late nights, all of the, you know, it, conference calls and all of the things that it takes to get to that point and, and the dinners and whatever to get to that point. So let me ask this, like you're, you're talking about like going from 56 cents to running, you know, $120 million company. Mm -hmm. What you described it as entrepreneurial spirit. What do you think about you gave you the unique skill set or the unique kind of, uh, not not staying down when you get knocked down mentality to be able to be successful at all those different various things because i'm sure that there's something about your personality like because mm -hmm. everything you listed is is pretty different like there's hospitality there's sales there's um managerial there's personal personnel management there's all different facets that that some people have very strong skill sets in and there's other things that people don't have at all but you're kind of showing success in all of those so if you think back on it, or if you think about the things that are your superpowers, what do you think that is? And don't say entrepreneurial spirit because you're no, 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 it's not that. <laughs> um, uh, look, I, I had a big talk a while while ago, Doug and John, about about superpowers, and I I think there's superpowers that you ha you get genetically, and there's superpowers that you develop along the way, hmm. and you lean into those. Hopefully, you can lean into those. I think genetically, my superpower was uh, a, a deep well of energy and the ability to recover really well. And what I mean by recover is I, I could I could do a 17 hour shift and take an hour nap and go do another 17 hour shift. Right. I could, you know, I, uh, I mean, you know, I've run, you know, 25 hours straight. Right. And in the middle of it, I took an 11 minute nap and I, you know, I woke up. <laughs> You know, I, I woke up refreshed. So I think that genetic superpower is like this really deep well of energy and the uh, ability to recover. I don't think I control those. The, the learned superpower was I really, really couldn't fail because if I failed, 
there was nobody there. I couldn't rely on anybody else. There was nobody to turn to. I didn't want to be like, you know, some laying in the gutter, you know, whatever that never, never hit my potential. And I knew, I knew that I had to work harder and that I didn't make the greatest choices or I wasn't given the best cards to, to deal with. And I just said, man, you got to figure it out. Like you got, you got to figure it out. That was my deal. Like always figure it out. You got to figure out how to get ahead. And so I think the adapted superpower was just saying you cannot fail. Like failure is not an option. Um, let me ask this, like to dig a little deeper into that. Is that a, from the balls of your feet or from your heels? Like, is that based out of, of, or does, or does it matter? Yeah. Like for, for you, is that based out of strength or is that based out of, oh my God, I, I can't like fear of failure. Like I can't fail. Well, there's an, it's a great question. I, I think in my case, there's a number of different things. Like sometimes I'm on my toes going, Hey, I got to get from point A to point B. But most of the time I'm on my heels saying, man, I cannot let the worst happen, whatever the worst is. Right. I can't be found out that I don't have the college education. I better work hard. Feel you, I better have feel you higher 100% sales percent on that one. That is one I identify with a hundred percent. Right. Cause uh, people are going to think you're a fraud. Right. And, 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 and that happens in, in, in life. But I think really, I mean, when I, when I, if I, if I were to be a skull cracker and crack my own skull and try to, you know, use my five cent psychology uh, <laughs> mind, uh, um, I, I had a horribly angry and mean, nasty mother. And I had a, who was very young when she had me and a dad who was a sweet man, but very, very, very old when he had me. And I, I think, um, I, probably went through the first 35 years of my life trying to figure out how I could solve the problems that that gave to me. I didn't know it. I wasn't aware of it. But when, when you got, um, you know, no role model, you, you, all you got to do is try to make up for what the, you know, what am I supposed to do? Like, you can say, say it. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, I don't know what to do. Like yeah. nobody's, ta nobody's talked to me and said, do this, do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. So I got to figure it out on my, I got nobody to look at. On the other hand, I got somebody who, you know, one day you do X and they go, oh my God, you're the greatest person in the world. And the next day you do X and they're like, what the hell were you even thinking? That's the most horrible thing you could ever do. And it's like, wait, but both times I did X, do you know? And so I, I think that confusion of not being able to please one person and the confusion of not knowing what the hell to do from minute to minute. Like you, you said earlier, like you got this path, you got to stay on. I had no path. I don't know. even know what that means. Yeah. Right. So I'm just going around trying to fix fires, trying to dig myself out of holes. Sometimes I dug them myself, but trying to dig myself out of holes and using this unending energy and this like desire to not fail and, and just going from thing to thing. And, and, you know, Doug, like, like you said, you could identify with, man, I, I had to accomplish whatever the task at hand was because otherwise, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't belong in the room in the first place. Right. I think That'll, that would prove it. Yeah. I think it's an interesting place to approach. I don't know if we want to call it uh, imposter syndrome, right. But to approach it from a place where there is not the sheepskin, there's not those things. We all doubt ourselves in those spaces. But when you don't have a roadmap or you've decided to take that roadmap that you've been given and, and crumple it up and throw it away, um, you end up in a space where you have to figure things out for yourself. And I think that that may be part of, you, you spoke early on about how you have a resilience. And I think that that's an interesting way to think about why you ended up in that space. You know, as you are, you're saying, hey, it took me until I was 35 to unravel certain pieces. And you were just on this path of trying to, to put pieces together. Do you think that looking, looking back, that was your path? Because having a path, do you think it matters for someone to lay that out for you? Or do you feel like that's a thing that you were better to find on your own? Because that's, that was part of your story. Well, it's a great question. We all live our own lives. I have a friend, his name is Jonathan, oddly enough, John. And I tell everybody, the dude has never taken a step that he didn't know what was 
underneath his foot when he put his foot down. Like he knew every single, he knows every single step of every. It might come with, it might come with the name. Cause uh, yeah, that's, 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 yeah, that's me. That's you. Like, and and I, and I kind of admire it in one sense because I'm like, man, how can you have that much insight and patience and like understanding Mm. of where you fit in the world? And on the other side, I'm frustrated and, and kind of upset at him because I'm like, dude, like, how do you already know everything? Like, like, how is that even possible? Like, how is it possible? You know, what's around the corner? I, I mean, I, I just don't get it. Like, but, but whatever it is, it comes around the corner. He's already prepared for it. Cause he took the 10 steps needed to get around the corner. And I'm just like, whatever. So my I, I don't ADHD know what, does not let me make that. <laughs> <laughs> but does that make sense though? I, I so I don't know yeah. which one's, I don't know which one's well, better. It's interesting listening to you guys talk about it because I've talked about it on the show before as as I guess the one person in this room that that has has the sheepskin and can sit here and say like I've worked with. Oh really? People. Oh really? Okay, we got to do that. No, here, no. Right? What what <laughs> what I'm getting ready to say is I've worked with people that for them it mattered, and I've worked with a lot of people that it it simply doesn't matter. Like, can you check the boxes? Are you able to do the job? Um, but but the the piece about it is 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 my wife Amanda and I were talking about this the other day that both of us were considering getting an MBA right out of college, and now we're both at a point where it's like, well, what's the point? Because I have I have the acquired experience. I've I've kind of done it, and and what is that going to do other than add debt or you know, some sort of college debt or just cost a lot of money and take time away from experiencing life as it is now? Because I kind of was the opposite of the way that you're approaching it, of where it was like the very clinical, like American kid where you go to high school, you try and get good grades, do well in your test scores. You go to a, like, you get to pick your school, you go to a college, pick what, what place you want to go to. And I was lucky enough to be able to have good enough grades to pick the school that I wanted to go to, to study the thing that I wanted to study, get the co-op program and, and get those things and like put those things into place. But that doesn't change the fact that even up until like this morning, you still batter, battle imposter syndrome in those positions of like, am I good enough to walk into this room and, and talk about this, you know, $5 million project? Am I, am I ready to walk into this space? So mm-hmm. I don't like, you know, he, Doug here and you asked the question, like, does the path matter? Like, I, I feel like that's kind of like asking it is, does everybody need religion? Like, Sure, some people benefit from that structure and benefit from, you know, that that kind of communal feel and, and, and some sort of like underpinning. But there's a lot of people that are like, I'm cool being atheist or agnostic and like that's that's my jam and, and I can function in that space. So hmm. I think it's more it's more interesting to hear you, David, talk about spending that much time figuring out what happened in the first thirty five years of your life and trying <laughs> to solve some of those things about yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think it, it then starts to inform a lot of the things that you've chosen to do, you know, after accomplishing a lot of kind of the things that p- people point to as the American dream. So, yeah, let me give you an analogy. Okay. I did an 85 mile run in Mexico. Okay. Seems, seems so- reasonable. Solo run, <laughs> right. Just did it on my own. Uh, I had some friends there to support me. But I had done enough endurance athletics at this time in my life. This was like, you know, maybe 12, 13 years ago. And I kind of knew everything I knew about this path that I was going to go on. I'm going to do this 85 mile run. I know the heat. I know how to prep for it. I know how to hydrate. I know how to measure my hydration. I mean, I got everything. I'm paying off the local um, the local uh, 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 police officers so that I can have a per a non-permitted van following me on the highway. And I'm, I got everything, man. I got everything. I used every piece of knowledge that I had. And I went into this thing as like, I got this. I'm not an imposter. I'm the dude, right? I'm, I, I got it. I go, I start in downtown Cancun and I start running and I get maybe about seven or eight m- minutes in and all of a sudden this horribly vicious dog starts attacking running right at me now i got a van right behind me with a bunch of people in it and there are a couple of them are locals that are driving and they race the van in between me and the car uh, dog start honking the horn and the dog goes running off and i went and i went like what the hell you didn't even think that like the wild dogs like what how would you not think about that okay 
40, oh, 22 and a half hours, 42 dogs tried to attack me. <laughs> that run. I kept count, right? Yeah. My, my point in telling you, did that you put little dogs on the van? Like, no, the they market? kept a little, like... uh, yeah, right. They kept a little notepad and started making tick marks with all the dogs that were oh, coming shit. after me. Oh, and, are you saying like the bomber, do Doug, where you like, yeah, you have yeah, the like amount the of planes like, you yeah, shot yeah, down? We ran <laughs> off this many dogs. Like the Ohio State. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, the Buckeye, yeah, the Buckeye thing, helmets, yeah, the little helmet thing. Exactly, yeah, same thing. No, so, but my point in telling you that story, John, is that you could be totally prepared. You could have every step figured out, and you know everything from your experience and from your brains and from whatever. And then all of a sudden, the most obvious thing hits you, and you're like, "What the hell was I thinking? Like, 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 like I'm such an idiot." But you just figure it out. And so I, I think when it comes to wanting to do great things, when it, like living your life or wanting to start a business or accomplish whatever. I just believe you got to just not think you got all the answers going into it. I, I prefer to go into it without having all the answers and then figuring it out like as quickly as I can, as deep as I can. And just, just figuring it out. Cause I already know I can't plan for everything. Mm -hmm. How did I not know wild dogs were going to attack me in the middle of Mexico? How did I not I know mean, that? You don't I mean, it's just dumb. <laughs> I mean, but but here's the thing. You're looking at everything else. I think this is very apropos at this exact moment that we're having this conversation because my wife and I are about to welcome our first child. That is super exciting. We are very excited. I am doing a lot of research. I know a lot of stuff. In fact, I went to a childbirth class a couple weekends ago. I could have taught and done a better job. To be clear, I like research. But also, I cannot control any of what happens in many different ways, it's baked. The situation's going to be what it is. And whatever human I have to deal with is going to throw me curveballs all the way. And if I think I can research my way out of that that bag, I can't. I'm so and excited to see what wild dog shows up in the, in this whole situation. Like what's, likely the, what's the wild dog going to be? Feral wild animal <laughs> living in my house. In addition to the three non-feral <laughs> dogs I have. Yes, exactly. But I think, but I think this is the thing, and and that's just apropos to my situation. So I see that right in. But this happens just consistently. We approach these things, and we approach different spaces, and we say, okay. I feel like I can control for all these things, but you have to remember something's always going to come at you and you're not, not going to know the solution, but you're going to have to figure it out. When you, when you're, you know, you're, you're talking and I'm doing some math here, which is not my strong suit. You had said, Hey, I really didn't get into bikes until my thirties. You know, and you're talking about how, spending all this time figuring yourself out and getting that sorted kind of feeling like you're a normal human being about 35, which is how I felt. Um, it, it's it's interesting. Is there some juxtaposition between those two things and you finding the triathlon and finding the physical challenge piece of your life? Do you find dichotomy or is there some sort of like intersection of that? Definitely. It's an intersection. It's like one of those wild, like middle of Buenos Aires, Argentina intersections where 17 roads come in and they go around <laughs> one little point and there's yeah. a gold statue in the middle of the point. And you're like, oh, and, and everyone's honking. Is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Been there. yeah. yeah. <laughs> so at the time, that time in my life, I had had um, a number of things go on. So I'm in my late thirties and um unhealthy i'm sedentary i'm overweight i'm a smoker i'm completely stressed out i have four-year-old twins and i'm escaping a abusive alcoholic who i'm probably in danger my kids might be in danger and it's just not it's not a good situation um so i got all of that going on and i'm starting to realize and part of that was 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 somebody hit me with knowledge at the right time in my life i was complaining about my life and in in, in in very short story i was complaining about all the crap that was in my life and all the bad decisions i made and all the people that were mean and the situation with my ex-wife and all of this and my buddy looked at me and he said dude i'm so tired of hearing you complain that they're not the problem you're the problem and i'm like huh and he goes yeah every time that you see a problem a person or whatever you reach out and you pet the rabid dog like it's not going to bite you 
He goes, what the hell is your problem? Why don't you stop trying to fix things? Why don't you stop trying to make the dog not rabid? And why don't you look in the mirror and take care of yourself? Like, what's your problems you need to fix? Stop trying to fix everybody else's. And I went, hmm. oh, yeah, okay. And then at that same time, my sister called me up. She's living a great life. We're very close in age and you know, young, young family, the whole deal. And she tells me she has terminal brain cancer. And I'm like, oh my goodness. So here I am like just barely starting to open my eyes to the fact that I got to start living a kind of John life. Like I got to get on a path and make steps and make it logical and like do it on purpose. And like, I'm finally starting to see that light and I'm thinking, okay, that's a long path forward for me. And at the same time, I hear from my sister, who's now on a very short path and yeah. that's going to lead to her death. And all of that combined just made me really take stock of who I was, where I was at in life, what I wanted to be. And I like to say that was the time when like my whole life, my whole life, I had learned unbelievable lessons. Okay. Really fantastically difficult, sometimes fun, but mostly very, very difficult lessons. And I put them on a metaphorical little cards in my back pocket. And as I got older in life, right? As I'm starting to run businesses, I'm starting to do whatever. I pull out a card and I show it to somebody and I go, look at this is a lesson you need to learn. And da, 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 da. I never had applied any of those lessons to myself. And so in oh. the middle of all of that, I just said, dude, why don't you take some of your own medicine? Why don't you apply this to yourself? Why don't you do things on purpose? So in, in, in this situation, and I think there's, there's, there's about to be a lot of parallels to to this and and kind of where we are now with with seemingly so many things in in, in everybody's life feeling like they're on fire and, and everybody's screaming and, and you open anything any app on your phone even if it's just the news even the headlines are overwrought with just like everything is on fire um when when you have somebody like that that's close to you that is as you said on a short path and yeah. and you have so many things on you that are on fire and you're so used to being the one that has to find the answer like you even said it yourself like i have i have to figure these things out mm -hmm. how do you, how how do you go about or how did you go about because i think it's probably a different answer for everybody but how did you personally go about putting the brakes on 37 38 years of of entrenched decision making of trying to help others and and start to internalize and look at the man in the mirror and and say okay what you know what is the common denominator in these things and and how do i how do i actually start to take control of what's going on in my life like mm -hmm. what are what are like how how do you like I, I hate to dumb it down like so simply but like how did you do that yeah and i wouldn't have been able to answer this question uh, 10, 12 years ago, right? I just wouldn't, I sure. wouldn't have been equipped to answer it because I didn't know because I wasn't still consciously doing it. But I do know now for me, it was, it was kind of like a three-step process. Now a lot went into the ingredients, but there was maybe like three steps. Okay. And the first step was, and I, and I did this, John, not metaphorically. I did this actually, I literally stood in front of the mirror and said to myself over and over and over, who the hell are you? Like, what, like, what are you all about? Like, look at yourself. Like, like you're, you're overweight. You're a smoker. You, you, you have got found yourself into every problem you could find yourself into and you solve these problems. And sometimes you solve them for other people, but sometimes you don't, and you get nothing out of it. Like, you're just like, like, who are you? And I just said it over and over and over and over. And I couldn't come up with an answer. Like I knew qualities that I had, Sure. But I didn't know who I was. And so that was step number one. Step number two, again, I didn't know at the time, but I do know it looking back. Step, step number two for me was that I just l freed my mind. I just let it go. In my case, it was forgiving myself. I had to forgive myself for not knowing what I didn't know back then. Right. You just life gave you whatever it gave you and you didn't sure. know any better. So just forgive yourself. You did the best you could. And even when you didn't do the best you could, you didn't know any better. Just forgive yourself, move on. Sometimes that freeing your mind was like not being angry at the world, not being mad at yourself, not whatever, just let it go. Like free your mind. 
If you can take an honest assessment of yourself and if you can free your mind and go, okay, I'm letting it all go. Then you could do step number three, which for me was learning, like leaning into what, what am I going to find out? And again, I didn't know it at the time, but um, it all kind kind of came together with, with that, with, with, with that, with, with those steps. And, and again, a ton of ingredients, but it was, it was pretty sure. much a three-step process for me. Really be honest about who you are and who you're not, right? Forgive yourself or do whatever you need to do to free your mind to just let go and then just lean into learning. We're... Were you able to, I, I know you want to ask something, Doug, but were you able to immediately he, like hear the questions? Because I think that there, there's, there's a huge challenge for a lot of people. Like this is something in my field with anything creative where you have to steal, like essentially steal yourself and steal your ego to anything, knowing that, that the goal is to solve the problem. It's not personal. And, and I think that for me, that was the perfect field for me to go in because I've always been that person that that's always kind of searching as to who, who are you and, and what, you know, what's your purpose and and how are you going to fit into this whole thing? So starting to knock down a lot of that ego took, I mean, it's, it's still a process for me and it started in freshman year in college when I was 18. So 20 years now. Um, but is that something for you that when you start to do that, like I'm envisioning that scene from from Goodwill Hunting where Robin Williams is talking to to Matt Damon's character and saying like, it's not your fault. And mm-hmm. then he like immediately gets angry in right. return. Like, no, right. it's not your fault. It's not yeah. your fault. It's not your fault. And we're, uh, Amanda and I were watching The Adam Project last night and there's a scene very similar to that at the end of it where the dad and Ryan Reynolds' character are kind of having the same thing where... Ryan Reynolds' character is so angry at his dad for for passing away. And there's time travel involved and all this other mm-hmm. stuff, but he he has so much trouble forgiving him for that for that burden that he put on him for for dying in a car accident that that he has to just say it over and over again. No, I do love you. No, I do love you. No, I do love you. So for you, like saying it over and over again and in in questioning that over and over again, like how long did it take you before you actually started to be receptive of? understanding of like i'm definitely not perfect and i've fucked up a lot of stuff in my life well i answered the the question like this and i mean i really literally answered it like this i said you have no idea who you are like you you don't even know like you don't even know what you're about what you want to do i mean i could list my qualities and accomplishments and whatever but i was just like man you y- you don't, the only thing I really knew about myself at that point was that I had made all these decisions that was to be what I thought other people thought I needed to be, or this is what I was going to ask you. Yeah. Or what I thought they expected me to be. Yeah. Right. And, and that's, it's hard, it's hard because you want to do a good job, but am I doing a good job? I used to say to my kids, right? I have wonderful kids. I used to say, look, I'm not cooking you dinner because I think you expect it. And I'm not even cooking you dinner so that people will go, wow, you're a good dad. You're cooking dinner. I'm literally cooking you dinner because I really want to do that. Like I I love cooking you dinner. So the same thing, I'm cooking dinner. But why am I doing it, right? (laughs) Before (laughs) everything I did was, well, because I thought maybe people would think I'm supposed to do that. Or I did it because maybe you would think differently of me or whatever. I didn't do it for me. Same, same, same thing, but very, very, very different level of fulfillment and motivation. And that's a, that's a silly example, but it's, it's, it's everything in my life was that, that I, and I just, I came up with this concept of this middle of the pack mentality where I said, yeah, you know what? Nobody really cares and nobody's watching. So why are you so worried about it? You just, nobody, nobody really cares. Nobody's watching, which is a good thing. Like you only care. Why don't you start caring? And that's what I was, I like, I was going to basically be like, okay, well, when you look that person in the mirror, are you able to deal with the fact that like, nobody, nobody gives a crap. I saw something on Instagram today. It's like every single person, you know, has a totally different idea of the person you are. And I'm like, huh, great. Now I'm going to be wrecked for the rest of the day. (laughs) Now I'm going to be worried about what everybody else thinks about me, which I'm already worried about. Thanks for feeding my psychosis Instagram. Don't go on Instagram. It's a bad place. But that, but like, this is, this is the thing. 
you fulfill those things in your own head. And I love that you're, you've like, you realize that you were doing that to yourself and started to figure out a way to break that down and like try to get through that piece of it. Cause we put ourselves in those boxes. We do. And I'll give you another one that'll mess with your mind. I'm stealing this from a friend of mine, but it is the idea of Sonder. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Saundership and, and what Sonder means. And Sonder is this, and he asked me, he said, can, can you remember the first time that you understood the concept of Sonder? And I'm like, mm, I don't even know what the word means, but go ahead, lay it on me. And he said, Sonder is a innate, deep, to the cellular level understanding of the fact that you are just passer buyers in everybody else's life and they're just passer buyers in yours. Mm. It's your life mm. to live. Nobody else can live it. You can't live theirs. You're just a passer buyer. It's your life. You got to live your life. When's the first time you recognized that you're just passer buyers in everybody's life and they're a passer buyer in yours? And I went, holy crap. Yeah, I think when I was standing in the mirror, looking at myself, asking myself who I am, like I had no idea. But then I knew at that point, that I'm just, I'm just a passer buyer in everybody else's life and they are in mine. Why don't I start living my life? Yeah. It's, mm. it's crazy. It's a crazy deep concept. Mm. Well, and, and it's it, conceptually, yes. But, but if, if we think, like, if I think back to so much of our Western culture is founded on, on this idea of keeping up with the Joneses or, um, driven by consumerism or whatever ism you want to talk about that that we're we're fed this this version of this is what this is how you're supposed to act this is how you're supposed to treat people this is what you're supposed to do you're supposed to go here and then you're supposed to go here and then you're supposed to do this and we're we're almost like bred into this this idea of you're supposed to do those things and the idea of focusing on self and worrying about self-worth and self-place and and how you fit into all of these things if if you're not paying attention to that and you hear that phrase or you hear that description of Sonder, then it's like wow that's dark because it's like oh you're alone like and it feels it feels scary it's empowering but it's yes so but if you actually totally acknowledge is. it for what it is then it is super super empowering because it's like i i can be the one in the driver's seat but i can Correct. also like be a part of all of these other things at the same time yeah but also be be aware i'm a narcissist so i'm basically <laughs> like cool it is my movie you fucking passersby i appreciate <laughs> you thank you for showing up this is mine truman show <laughs> no I, I joke i joke but but uh, right, I, and you look you're probably going to do everything you can to put your kid in front of you and you're going to do everything you can to make your wife happy and all those things are great i'm not saying be self-centered what i'm saying is how about being self-aware and this that what you said earlier john this me generation like it's all me 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 accumulate accumulate look at me look at me it's it's a different i'm talking about a whole different thing and it's yeah. where we're at right now in the world which is this wonderful not everywhere in the world some of us are a lot luckier than others but um we're at this place where we all kind of had to put ourselves in front of a mirror we all couldn't walk around freely we couldn't go outside and 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 drown our sorrows and vacations and new cars and friends and whatever yeah. we had to like literally sit there and take a stock and what are people doing when they do that they're like hey man it's my life yeah who am i to conform to whatever they said about what kind of education i should have and what kind of job i should have and where i should live and how i should commute and who i blah, blah, blah. and people are like man oh man you know what i need to worry about my health i need to worry about my yeah. state of mind I need to worry about getting the most out of my life. This which is great. This is what I was getting excited about in the green room. It's like <laughs> the, the the idea of of everything that's gone on during the pandemic that's happened around everybody. I was gonna say to us, but for some of us it's it's just kind of happening around us and enveloping mm -hmm. everything that we do. So it's not it's not happening to you. It's just it's happening in Doug's world. Um but <laughs> 
but then then everything that's been kind of spawned out of it the 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 calling it the great resignation and so many people changing jobs and 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 all of these things and like you hear pundits talking on TV about like why it's happening and and the the economic indicators that it's happening blah 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 and it's like no it's because of exactly what Let's talk I know about it's exactly what we were just talking about is this stuff is happening because people were stuck inside and they had to sit and bathe in their own garbage for a while and live the life that like us weird introvert like psychoanalyst people that have been doing this since we were like seven <laughs> have been doing this whole time and like didn't have a choice but to be in your own head and figure out like man this sucks and now nah, it sucks it'll be over with and it's like oh god it's still going it still mm -hmm. sucks maybe maybe i actually have to acknowledge why this sucks that'll be over soon it's fine i'll just like get by with you know, whatever. Or, Year two arrives. <laughs> right. And you just like, it just keeps going. And, and, you know, even like some of the stuff that we've had in some of our intros where Doug and I are talking about like, yeah, it's getting nicer out and, and the light coming with, you know, Omicron leaving and, and some of that stuff. And yes, I know there's another variant in Europe and all that stuff, but it feels as though this is the first time that there is truly a light that might not be a train at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. Um, but but we've talked pretty openly about like, man, just like, ugh, just feeling so bogged down by all of the weight of it and and all of the just like garbage that's that's accumulated and and I think about like being a cyclist and and it feels like the the human version of like we all need to clean out our exhaust and like get all of the carbon out and it, it's just there's so much built up frustration and angst and and losing community and just all of those pieces that like for for those folks that are struggling like how how can we how can we steer this conversation into giving them some sort of useful uh useful guidance in into what's going on right now wow yeah that's a pretty heavy ask right there i mean uh, you know honestly um I think that this is an opportunity for us collectively to transform into something better. Now you can't argue with the math, right? The math is we're basically a millisecond. Humanity is a millisecond of existence. Just a mil and sure. where are we inside I'll that play. millisecond? Just a fraction of a millisecond, right? I mean, it's just, it's, it's not even funny. So, so <laughs> If you understand that there's, you just can't measure that kind of stuff. All you can do is live in this moment and be the best you in this moment. And I love what somebody said to me is they said, you know, I like to keep um, like uh, I make a five minute, a five hour or a five year decision. And I'm like, huh? And they go, yeah. Is this thing going to affect me in five minutes? If it's not, then why the hell am I caring about it? If it's going to affect me in five hours, or five days even, well, I'll think about it, but really I'm not gonna give it that much thought. But if I gotta live with the effects of this decision for five years, I'm gonna give it a little bit more. So I, it's like, well, maybe like, like each moment, if we could treat it like it's a five-year decision, how cool is it? How many times do we waste time? How many times do we do the wrong thing? How many times are we doing something that our inner voice is telling us not to do? It's like, well, why don't we try to rely a little bit more on the fact that every decision is a five-year decision? Mm. I mean, honestly, it's hard to do all the time, but we can do more of it and more of it and more of it. I think we can, I really believe that we can come out of things like this. And there's very few times in history where something like this has happened with an enlightened people, with fast communication, with ridiculous uh, uh, means, with um, the permission to talk. You came back from World War II. You didn't have permission to talk. You, you no. made it through the Dust Bowl. You didn't have permission to talk, right? It was just like, that's what being human is all about. Now shut your mouth and get to work, right? No, we had, now we have permission to talk. We have permission to think. We have, we have the means. We have quick communication. I mean, wow, we really have the opportunity to come out of this well. But I think the only ingredients are self-care, so, you know, being self-care and, and self-aware, and then obviously you got to have the one major thing which is like you're not out to to ruin people 
Yeah, just don't be <laughs> don't be garbage. Step one, don't be right. garbage. Right. Yeah. But step then, one, don't be a bad dude. Yeah. yeah. After that, That's timely. Yeah. 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 After that, it's it's pretty much you know what t- t- take really really good care of yourself and it's and it's going to help everybody around you. I mean, sure thing, sure. Doug. I guarantee you, there's got to be some thoughts in your head of I got to be my best me because man, I got a kid coming into this world and I want to be the best me when that kid is aware of who I am. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I think that's, I think that's a good place for us to all operate and like kind of try to lead our lives from if we're not trying to lead our lives from a place of making sure we're okay. So we can take care of other people. Right. I'm a fixer. I like to fix stuff. John is too. Like, I think that's just part of our nature, but we're no good at doing any of those things unless we're taking care of ourselves. And I think it's important to have that self-awareness. And I love that you, that you talk about that. So you're go through all of this journey. And I kind of want to ask this because um, this is kind of a left turn. You're go through all this stuff. You start to figure out all these things. You get involved in doing triathlons. You're on the bike and we have barely touched the bike, which is fine, but you're doing all this stuff and you're developing, as you even said, this, like this very much middle of the pack idea, this thought of this, what in God's name <laughs> were you like, I don't know. I'm gonna write a book. This seems like the correct thing <laughs> for my life right now. What were you doing at the time that, you know, like, you know, job career wise, what was your family structure at that point in time? What were the factors that led you to say, you know what I need to do is I need to write a book. This seems like the right decision for me. Um, well, the minute winning in the middle of the pack book uh, came about because uh, about five or six years into doing endurance athletics, I realized that there's a lot of parallels between the life lessons that you can learn along the way, lessons in running a really big business and lessons in doing endurance athletics. They're kind of the same, right? Like when we Lots say of parallels, tons of parallels, tons sure. of parallels. When I said, you know, just like start off, like not being a dick. Okay. Start off with that. <laughs> that's, that's that chapter one. If that's right. chapter Base one, level, yeah. everyone needs right. to go buy but it for, right now. If chapter prologue. One, then don't be but, don't start right. off but as a dick. Then there was you could apply that. Yeah, you could apply that to standing in line at the grocery store. You could apply that to walking into a room of 800 employees. You could apply it to, uh, uh, you know, um, having a one-on-one with a mother-in-law that you don't like. Whatever, right? That's a really good rule. Number one, it doesn't matter where that, where that. So, what what I thought was, um. Yeah, not from a preachy kind of thing, but just from a, hey, I think I figured something out here, this this middle of the pack thing, where if you're anything like me, where you just been living your whole life trying to be something that you thought other people wanted you to be or that you hoped that they would think of you a certain way, if you if that resonates with you, I got some thoughts on that here. I'm going to write them down. And oh, by the way, like the parallels of that with running a business, with, with running 100 miles, they're pretty, they're pretty much um, very interchangeable. And I, and I wanted to write this from a kind of a narrative story kind of based thing. And the lessons are really simple. I'll give you one, one great lesson. Okay. About total imposter syndrome and, and how not just imposter at work or out on the field or in love or what, whatever. So the very first, I, I stopped smoking. I, I did a, a two minute run a day later, a one mile run about a week later. I did a 5k a couple of weeks later. I did a triathlon a couple of weeks later and I'm getting ready to do, this was in February, J- July. I'm getting ready to do my first half Ironman. Okay. That's a, uh, that's a very fast progression. That's a fast friend. progression. Good work. Good work. Yes. Congratulations. So I'm doing this. I'm doing this half Ironman up in Northern California and it's a, it's a, a staged uh, start. Okay. So not a, it's it's not a, a mass start it's it's you know by, by age group wave start and i walk up to the top of the bank of the river and i look down and i went holy shit i go oh my god like every single chick is a greek goddess and every single dude is like adonis and i'm like they're all complete and i had never done any group training or any of that crap and i'm looking down at everybody's an athlete and I'm going, 
what the hell am I doing here? Look at these people. I don't have any fat. They're all wearing Speedos. They all are ripped. They all like are confident. And they all got this the gear. And I just, I'm going, what the hell are you even doing here? Okay. And how many times have I said that to myself in a business environment, in a relationship, in a whatever, where I go, what the hell are you doing here? And I said, man, I am going to go home. I'm turning around and going home. And then the gun goes off. And I watch these Greek God and goddesses jump into the water from, from, from the standing start. And I see one guy flip over on his back and he starts paddling backwards on his back. And I see another dude swimming like perpendicular to the course. And I see this other guy doing like the doggy paddle. And I'm like, dude, what are you worried about with them? Like, why don't you just worry about yourself, right? We're going to be fine. That dude can't swim. <laughs> I mean, he can't swim. I don't care what he looks like. He can't. You can swim. Yeah. Like, why uh, are you worried about everybody else? Right. Uh, that's good. That's good. So that's a story I tell where it's just like, like I, I could apply that to life. I could apply that to business. I can certainly apply it to my that first Ironman where I did not belong there. But that's because I was considering myself in relation to everybody else instead yeah. of just worrying about me. Right. So in, in just worrying about you, in thinking about both um, winning from the middle of the pack and cycle of lives, like, mm -hmm. had you had any experience writing outside of, of just regular business writing? Yes, uh, but never, yes, I had. I, I, I actually had a couple of brushes with success with writing early on. Um, I had, uh, mm -hmm. I actually had a very A-list celebrity um uh, pick up a script that I had written. Um, but really? I couldn't, that's awesome. It, yeah. But it, it, it just, it long story. It just never worked out, but Absolutely. it was one of the most phenomenal days of, of, of my writing life back in the day when you had, uh, uh, answering machines, I worked a late shift. I came home. I had submitted this script to, through a friend of a friend and to a very, very high level, uh, uh, agent writer's agent in in beverly hills and there's no way they would have read it but they you know it's months later months later months later i i, I just give it up i come home from work i press the record button and it's this agent and she's bawling her eyes out she's like that's the most beautiful thing i've ever read i don't care what time it is you call me you call me you call me and i was just like what the hell so nothing ever came from it except for a lot of lessons that I learned, but I've always had little brushes with things. And then um, oddly enough, both my parents were writers. Um, uh, and so I think it's a little bit, a little bit genetic and um, you know, I, I'm just drawn to it because it's, it's like, it's something that I love. It's something I think I'm pretty good at. Um, I've learned how to be better at it through uh, you know, proper editors and, and publishing and, and, sure. and, you know, really smart people looking at things and telling me how to do it better. Um, but it's something that I, I kind of have, have always been drawn to. That's cool. I think, I think that's neat that it's just kind of been like lurking out there and you've been like dancing with it for a while and then mm -hmm. made something happen in a kind of different way. You still have that script. Oh, I do have that script. Right. I, I probably should redo it. Uh, I probably well, have good. about no, like hey, 10. Well, I mean, maybe the opportunity is around the door. It, it could be. I have like 10 different project writing projects I'm working on. Some fiction, some nonfiction, some epic, some pretty easy. But And they're all very, very different. Um, and yeah, I'm building up the courage to allow myself to focus on that 100%. Because I, cool. do, I do... Taking away the imposter syndrome, I do feel like it's um I, I I forget which famous person said this, but some famous person said, um, uh, each of each of every single human has a gift. And if you're not giving your gift to the world, you're wasting your life. And I'm right. like, hmm, ah, yeah. no, no imposter thing. I'm not bragging, I'm not trying to sure. do that. But if that is a gift, um I'm wasting it by not giving it. Yeah. So I you know, building up the courage to, to do it more um, like openly full time rather than quietly full time. What's yeah. your favorite? Th what's your favorite like genre to write? Uh, really crazy uh, epics that puzzle together. Like like, for example, if you took the movie Crash, remember the movie Crash? Sure, perfect. Yep. Copy. Yep. You're watching that thing and you're just like, oh, my, like, how does everything tie here? together? Yeah. And, and it's this uh, this thing I learned early, early on in writing where uh, I don't remember who told me this, but I might have read it. It might have been uh, somebody that was 
I, I don't even remember, but they said that the goal of writing is that when you get to the last page, the person had no idea what was going to be on it. And when they're done reading it, they go, of course. Uh, oh, why didn't I see that? Yeah. <laughs> but they had no idea. Uh, love right? it. And so I, I like that kind of epic multi-story, like come in from 10 different points and then all of a sudden, boom, you got but it. That's I your think. life, right? Yeah. That's, that's totally. your life. That's yeah. your lived experience. Exactly. Oh my gosh. Somebody was paying attention. What the hell? Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, and if we go back to that, I think this is where that, like that through line comes between winning from the middle of the pack and cycle for life, because you already mentioned your sister's diagnosis and, mm -hmm. and, and we're talking about how this deals with business and it deals with these huge challenges and it deals with how do you, how do you physically and how do you like almost physically manage your way through these, whether they're physical challenge or their business challenges or, or, you know, whatever it is, looking at it from a, I don't want to call it capitalistic, but more of a business slant. Mm -hmm. Whereas cycle for life is, is talking about dealing with really, really heavy lifts when it comes to the emotional impact. Um, what living with dealing through cancer treatment is going to be like mm -hmm. being a survivor of somebody who's, who's been taken by cancer. Um, I don't know anybody listening to this that hasn't been affected by it in some way. I mean, it, it, our listeners have gone through, you know, my father-in-law going through sta uh, small cell lung cancer treatment. I recently had a friend pass away from breast cancer. Like it, it, it affects all of us so heavily. And, and I think you using, not necessarily using your sister's death as fuel, but like taking that as impetus to, to share some of your, uh, your gift to the world, um, feels like great seeds for where cycle for life came from but you actually put kind of put yourself into this as well and, and put kind of your own your own ass on the line in, in terms of mm -hmm. like committing to to doing something for it so kind of walk us through how that the, how that unfolded because we talked a little bit about where the genesis of of winning from the middle of the pack came from mm -hmm. but like walk us through how this one came to life so it came to life because um, it was a number of different things, but really I became acutely aware and then I was drawn to the idea that people were really good about talking about the tasks around their cancer and not so much the emotions. So how do mm -hmm. I find the right place to get my chemo? How do I get my kids watch while I go to the right. I go to my oncologist? How do I uh, navigate the healthcare system? How do that's I eat the stuff better? That's facts. That's facts. facts. Right. right. Yes. We're really good about that stuff. You know, like I'd much rather drop off a casserole than knock on the door and ask you how you're feeling. Right. <laughs> For sure. Right. Yep. I, yeah. A hundred percent. And so I noticed that, but it wasn't just uh, me. It wasn't just people that were watching others go through cancer. It was people that had cancer. It was caregivers, loved ones, survivors, doctors, medical professionals, you know, like executives in the medical world, the same thing when it came to the tra traumatic side of, uh, of, of the experience, they're very well, uh, ill-equipped to start really hard conversations. And I thought to myself, I wonder why that is like, 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 like wh why is it so, so prevalent? And if it is so prevalent, like what would be some keys to unlock uh, a toolbox that will give us a few things that we could put in our on our belt to bring to our 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 own experiences because who's not gone through trauma who is not carrying around trauma or seen people deal with things and yeah. it, it, it's a pretty lonely isolating place uh it's easy to abandon them because we don't want to start the hard conversations because we don't want to sound like an idiot. We don't want to say the wrong thing. We don't want to make people feel guilty. We don't, I mean, there's a million things that are preventing us from connecting. And I thought to myself, I go, if I could find enough people that were range of age, range of types of cancer, the severity of the cancer, their emotional responses to, to cancer, uh, because not, you know, that's all over the spectrum. Um, what kind of uh, range of traumas that they have in their young adult and childhood lives that we could identify with. Like if I could put together a really compelling group of people that had inspirational evocative stories and I could tell it in a real way, then maybe by understanding what people are going through, 
like I said, maybe we could take some of that to our own lives. So that's, that was the impetus. And, um, it, it, it's a really kind of touching story, but, you know, touching a little bit in a sad way is that I had uh, made a promise to my sister. I said, look, you know, you're not feeling that great. You're near the end of your life. And she had told me she wanted to be at this 24 hour relay for life and kind of cheer on the team that was put together to, to support her and raise some money and do all this other stuff. And I'm just like, dude, there's no way you're going to be there for the whole 24 hours. And she said, well, that's all I want. And I said, okay, then I'll be on the track for the whole 24 hours. And um, she died two days before the event. So she couldn't be there, but I said, I'm going to be there. Like I'm going to do the thing for the whole 24 hours. So I did. And I realized, Oh my gosh, man, people don't talk. And the craziest thing is during the day, like they play little games, they freeze a bunch of bras and then you got a kid's got to pull them apart. And it's like bringing awareness to breast cancer. And they, they, they do this water balloon things and, and all of this stuff. That's like giving people energy about the facts. Yeah. Right. And then at night, like, like you, you light these candles and you write this little private message on a bag and you put the candle inside the bag and they, and they do it up all beautiful. And it's this remembrance lap and everybody's silent. Nobody's talking. No one's sharing yeah. because why? pain with each other. And yeah. We don't know, yeah. We don't know experience. how. Yeah. And I was just taken by that. Like, I didn't know how either, but I, I noticed that people's, um, behind their eyes, you could just see there's so much going on. And yet we just weren't equipped to be able to start those hard conversations. So I said, Hey, you know what? Let, let me try to see if I can have an impact on that. How, how do you broker the conversation about, Hey, I want you to be part of my book, my book <laughs> about this traumatically painful, difficult thing. Well, if I said to you, look, I mean, honestly, Doug, you, you, um, nobody is going to know like the experience of having a kid with your type of situation and it's this and this is this. And I go, I want you to give me the real insight into all that emotion that's behind what you're going through. And I don't know, maybe you had lost a couple of kids before and they, they didn't come. Maybe you had a horrible childhood and all you want to do is make up for it by having somebody in your life I, there's could be a million things right sure yeah but 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 if 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 you believed in that story and that cause then and you had a, a, a evocative interesting inspiring story and we caught each other at the right time then maybe your knowledge and your passion and your insight and your experience with this particular topic could really sh shed some light for some other people could really help them so when i when i when i did that i said to people and not everybody I was able to bond with, and certainly not everybody was able to go sure, deep. For sure. sure. But, but um, the people that were, we had a really kind of noble mission, which is, I'm not going to change your names. I'm not going to embellish your story. I'm not going to hide anything. Let's get raw, dirty, deep. Like, like how, what, what prevented you from connecting in the deepest levels? Or if you did connect at the deepest levels, how did you do that? And let's just tell the truth and tell the story in a way that people could identify with. And um, when they bought into that, it wasn't so hard to say, yeah, so, you know, so let's say you got one kid with cancer and one kid with not with cancer. Can I talk to you about that? Like, is that, is that cool? Is that like, because people don't want to talk about David, that. additional right. co-host of the gravel lot. How do we pry open this yeah. can of worms? I appreciate <laughs> that. I appreciate that because that's what it's about. Yeah. Right? Well, you can't there, it, yourself, as John says, right? Like if you can't open yourself, you can't dig through that. Not everybody's accessible in that space, but I love that you are being the can opener mm -hmm. in a way that, that also came from a place of love because you were can opening yourself yeah. in this space. And, and I think there's so much to that. I, I mean, I think even some of the, some of the feedback that we've gotten from some of our episodes that end up kind of going down a path that's similar to that with, with certain folks of, you get you get an outpouring of support from from corners that you never would have even knew existed of people that said you know say things like i i never knew that there was somebody else that had a shared experience like mine or or i never knew that you know there that 
that there was somebody else out there that was that was feeling or thinking or or saying the same things that I've been feeling thinking saying um there's just there's so much to be gained from our society in general like if we if we go back to what we're talking about at the beginning of of this uh conversation about how uh, how so many of us are brought up to to think a very specific way and kind of be trained into into our western mm-hmm. culture mm-hmm. um that the, the cornerstone of it is not self-awareness it's not openness it's not mm. accessibility and in emotions and things like that and and i mean i i think back to like things in my life where you know reactions from parents where it's been like well just stop it like just stop like stop feeling that way like you get anger and 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 it's nice that we're getting to a point where as as a group of of humans we're getting to a point where it's like no we're going to talk about this and somebody else is going to connect to this and we all need to teach each other how to have this conversation and to teach each other this language because we have to because we can't all feel alone anymore and we can't all feel like we're the only ones dealing with these things. Um, and, and from, from my perspective, like sharing some of the stuff that's happened to, to me or my wife on this show and, and sharing those things and hearing people react to them and, and hearing folks react to some of the stories that folks have, have told on our show, like it is so needed in, in everything that we do as a culture with, with, all of these things that that we were talking about that are just wrong and everything feels on fire and and everything feels like it's wrong talking about those things and 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 putting those things about how you feel about something or this is how you know this is what happened to me and this is what it did to me and this this is how I handled it and and just starting to to establish some form of literacy to that for each other so we can have it the same way that we're having this conversation is Something that I genuinely look forward to, whether it's whether it's long after the three of us are are gone and in the ground, or or whatever we end up deciding to do with ourselves, um, but long after we're gone and off of this this plane, to think that as a species we could get to a point where we have that level of literacy with each other, where those things matter and we understand and we have a higher level of empathy for each other and and just a better understanding of of. We call it the backpack of of you know things that you have happen in your life that you just carry around with you of just everybody I, being better at seeing that stuff. Yeah, but what is really shocking is how little we have an awareness of what people are going through, what they have gone through. And let me go back to a, a story like right around when I'm doing all of this, my sister died about a year before and um, we enter the financial crisis. And that's a really oh, difficult time. I'm running a, a, a big business for a Wall Street firm. And one of my advisors um, jumped off the building. And it was, he had, he had young kids and it was just, it was absolutely horrible. Like just so tragic. And I had, had been in New York. I flew back to, to, to my hometown in California and I, I raced to the office and we weren't going to be able to get a grief counselor in there quick enough. So somebody had to walk around and talk to people. Okay. And I'm talking about people that I had gone on vacation with people that I had gone to barbecues with. I've laughed and joked and whatever. And I'm like, well, they're probably affected because you know what? One of the memories I have from when I was a kid is my next door neighbor uh, put a shotgun in his mouth in front of his kids on Christmas day. And I, I hadn't thought about it for years and years and years. And then I'm thinking, how could this freaking guy do that to his kids like what like, like how like, how could he do that to his wife and kids and then here i am with this guy in the building how could he do that to his wife and kids so i go okay maybe somebody has like an experience and i i guess i should talk to him because nobody's gonna be here to talk to him i walk into the first office and what was the person tell they eventually st- tell me a first person experience with suicide I'm not beat up, but at least there's somebody in the room like me. I had no idea. Man. This was like the happiest go luckiest. I would have no idea that guy was carrying around that trauma. I go to the next office, the same thing, the next, the next, the next, every single office. And I'm like, how did I not know this? There was one safe place to go. This guy, Stu, man, this guy, Stu, he was the safest place to go because he was such a gentleman. He was such a happy guy. He was like the neatest, wonderful old guy ever. 
And I walked into his office and he says, man, you look beat up. And I go, dude, every office I've gone into, I go, it's just tough. Like everybody's having a hard time with this thing. And I just, I'm shocked that everybody has this. I go, you got any vice spray? And he goes, yeah, but can I tell you a story first? And I go, yeah. He goes, I was playing tag with my brother. This was back in the, in the thirties. I was a little kid and we ran into the barn and my dad was hanging next to all the tools. And he goes, that's just stuck with me my whole life. And I'm just like, even you. And I'm like, what the hell? How did I not know that every single person was dealing with this immense trauma? How did I not know that? It's because we just don't know. We don't know what people are going through. We don't know what they've been through. And it was a real eye opener to realize that, man, we got to figure out a way to talk about this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, because it because that's that's the piece of it that's that's always, and it's it's disheartening that it's so shocking because there's, I mean we all we all have to deal with something at some point. Somebody's going to pass away in our life, or something, just statistically, but just the law of big numbers is going to happen. Statistically to, to terrible. Some, yeah, yeah, like something is going to happen in your life, and and whether it's a series of events or it's one or two, whatever, like something is going to happen, but. We just, it, it, it seems like we're not, I don't know if we're not allowed or if it's, I, I don't, I, n- not that the, that the cause or the why matters, but the fact that we're actually getting to a point where we can acknowledge it, acknowledge this as, as an outage and start to say, okay, who are, like, who are you? Exactly like what, what you were talking about earlier is, is how do, how do we as a culture do like strip fully naked into the mirror and look at it and say like who are we like who are we who are we like how do we how do we do this how do we navigate this for each other because there's there's just there, it, there's just so many gains to be made and 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 that's why i wish there's more things like what you're doing in your book or what we try to do with this podcast of of allowing folks to tell those stories and and kind of give a space for it just because it is Doug and I have had some bad stuff happen and we've had so much positive come from sharing those things with people and, and, mm-hmm. and having, having better connections because of it, that it's like, yeah, that's, that is fuel in and of itself. And, and it sounds like you've had a, a very similar reaction to cycle for lives where you take a leap and you do something that feels really uncomfortable, but you get so much support on the other side of it of like, mm-hmm. yes, this is so needed. We need a thousand more books like this. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. And I think it applies across the spectrum, whether it is, you know, the intersection that you kind of find that project in or uh, the intersection of cancer or whatever it is. I mean, we, we all carry that backpack with us and nobody really knows what that is. We just have to be able to fillet ourselves. We have to be able to open ourselves. And I think that ex- that thought experiment if we can do that individually just with the people in our lives or just the people that we feel it's okay. Maybe it's a stranger, right? Maybe it's someone you trust enough to not have the goods and the drop on you, um, you know, and, and know how to get, get into your business, but whatever it is, I think it, I think it is such a positive uh, move forward to normalize that conversation, to mm-hmm. normalize the space that we can have these, these things. Do you find that that is the reaction that you get when people like give you feedback about the work that you've been doing in those spaces? Yeah, it's it. I get a lot of, and I don't know the answers, right? I, I mean, these stories are, are are pretty impressive. I get a lot of questions like, um, you know, what am I supposed to say? Or, you know, what could I have done? And it's like, well, I, I don't know the answers. I, I do know what I've been told are some of the answers, which is, you know, don't say you're sorry. Don't make it about you. Don't use the word at least. Right. Oh, oh, yeah. I'm sorry you lost your leg, but at least you're healthy. You know, like, like, no, no, at least. Right. No, you know, none of that. Um, but I think um, it, it it really does come down to permission. And, and I, I really... I really think that is a key. It's like giving yourself the permission to say the wrong thing. If you're coming from a, a place of caring, if you have the right intention, if you're trying to connect with somebody in an authentic heart to heart, you know, really grounded way is to give yourself the permission. I'll give you, I'll give you a super quick story. So I was talking to this guy and not, not unlike you, John, he had just recently lost a friend to cancer. And he said to me, he goes, I really regret 
um, my last like several meetings with, with with him. And I said, why is that? And he goes, well, well, you know, when he was feeling well enough, he would come to my house or when he was feeling well enough to have people, I would go to his house and we would sit down and I'd kind of like want to talk to him because I knew he was getting worse and worse and worse. But, uh, you know, he just wanted to eat pizza and drink a beer and when he could and, and watch uh, watch a game. And every time I tried to open up the conversation, like he just shut me down. And I feel like, like I missed out on an opportunity because I never was able to get really deep with his emotional journey right then. And, and it really sticks with me. And I said to him, I go, well, I have a better um, perspective than that. And here's my perspective. What if you happen to have been the only person that you didn't have to talk to? What if you're the only person that didn't ask him a stupid question? What if you're the only person that gave him the safety to be himself and didn't judge him for eating pizza and drinking a beer when he's in the middle of chemo? Yeah. Right? yeah. I said, but maybe next time, if it happens, what I've learned next time, if it happens is not to um, let the moment pass, but to say, Hey buddy, I'm trying to talk to you about something serious. Now we don't have to, if you don't want to, but I want to. And if you don't give me that, it's cool, but I just want you to know, like, I, you can't say anything stupid. I don't want to bring you down. I don't want to say anything stupid. You don't want to bring me down. We all, we got to get that out of the way. So do you not want to talk? Cause you don't want to talk or do you not want to talk because you're afraid I'm going to judge you or what's yeah. the deal? Then now we can have the permission. Just give yourself permission. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's hard. Those are hard conversations to have, man. They're hard. But they're freeing, right? They're freeing. Yeah. Do you, do you find that through this process of you doing all these things and kind of working through this and working through this with other people and trying to figure out how to tell their stories correctly and doing all that, do you find that you've freed some of that in yourself? Um, a little bit. I definitely have a deeper understanding that um, that there's way more behind the curtain than I know. And when you're successful or you're active, you know, like you're juggling a lot of things, you make quick decisions. And uh, oftentimes those decisions in retrospect are kind of shallow because you're making them based on what you think, you know, and a lot of times we just don't know what we don't know. Bingo. So, all right. And so I think I've learned that there's a little bit more behind that in, in, in using your analogy, there's way more in the backpack than, than I knew is in there. And so that's given me the ability, I think, to be a little more sensitive to that idea. You know, like, like I'm not a fan of trite sayings, um, you know, like uh, just, just strap on your boots and yeah, I, you know, I don't, I, whatever. So I I'm talking to this woman and she tells me very early on, she goes, well, the key to life is just putting your feet on the ground and going about your day. And I roll my eyes going, you got to be kidding me, man. Why am I even talking to this woman? And then I find out in very short story, I'm going to tell you, I find out that she had cancer five different times, five different cancers over a 35 year period in her life. Okay. They've cut out everything. They've given her as much chemo as you can. They've given her as much surgery. There, there's she, cancer comes back again. There's just no way. That's not her story. Her story is a couple of months before she found uh, out about her first cancer, she met someone who gave her the safety to be loved and to let them be loved, to let her love them. And this was really, really important for her, I found out, because a few months before that, she had literally done the whole change her identity and escape a four-year insanely abusive relationship where it was coming to a point where she was either going to kill him in self-defense or she was going to get killed. And when she says to me at the end of our talks, we talked for about a year and a half. And when she says to me, I, I, I ask her again, I go, so, so what's your like overriding theme in life? And she goes, well, David, I didn't always have the power to do much, but every day I get up, I put my feet on the ground. I go about my day. Sometimes my day is making my bed and falling back into it. I'm like, Oh, sh there is some shit behind that trite <laughs> saying, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, originally, when she told me that, oh, just put your feet on the ground and go about your day. I'm just like, oh, my God. This do, is do, just do, do. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, there's nothing I can take from that. There's nothing I can learn from that. Right. Like, how are you that shallow? And then I realized that that's one of the deepest things I've ever heard. Yeah. And because you have the context, you now have you unpack that backpack, you really see what's behind the curtain. And you're just like, holy cow, how could I ever learn? 
how to think that way. Like how amazingly deep is that? So this whole journey for me has given me a deeper understanding that there's just so much more that we don't know. And when we have the opportunity to make the deep connection, we, we got to seize that moment. So uh, I guess last question before we start to wrap up and, yeah. and, you know, we'll, we'll do our ad read and then we'll ask you our last question, which is very similar to what we just talked about. Um, but so in, in thinking about all of this in, in everything you've digested, whether it's, mm -hmm. it's talking through, you know, winning from the middle of the pack or, or the stories that you expose yourself to were a part of in recording and, and experiencing and seeing those things viscerally firsthand does that stuff does it satiate you or does it only whet your appetite to go just be even more voracious and and start to try and find all of those things like to to connect with as many people as humanly possible and to to hear all of those stories and unpack all of those backpacks yeah, so I'm writing this book about the the Greek gods, and I kind of never really understood like ambrosia, like 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 literally they're gods, and the only thing they eat is ambrosia, <laughs> right? The only thing, really, that's it. I'm thinking, like, how boring. But then you you realize that that is the elixir of life. That's what gives them their immortality. That is the thing that makes them gods. So why are they not going to only eat that? That makes sense to me now. Because to answer your question, it's it it's like the only thing that matters is is that that's the only thing you know. Um, not to not not to be rough on my mother in law, but she she said to me the other a couple of weeks ago. She goes like, "Yo, you go on these podcasts, you do these talks. Aren't you bored talking about the same thing?" And I'm like, every time I talk about it, it makes me want to talk about it more. <laughs> ah, like, like it's the opposite. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's the opposite. Once once you kind of get that that feeling you just you 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 just want more of it you it's, know and yeah. it's very much a drug I, like just like personal experience it, it mm -hmm. feels like when you when you make those connections even if it's something like this that's over sure. you know over the internet opening up those cans of worms as doug said and 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 having those conversations and connecting with another human it, it it's the closest i think that i've felt to like Oh, this is why we're all here. Like collectively, this is why we're all here. Yes. Did you ever see that movie Scrooge with Bill yes, Murray? Love it. Yes, Bill Murray. Fantastic. I've seen that movie at least a hundred times. <laughs> at the very end, when he's talking to the camera and he's trying to explain to people the change in him and the that once you realize that, like 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 you just want to do that and i just want to live every moment like that and you can live every moment <laughs> and he's like tearing up going you know like now i know it's okay to live that way and to be that person i'm just like yeah now i get it yeah that's it i love it i think i think that is the thing i think but i think that's what we're all chasing in some fashion right and i think the most important thing we can all do is tell our story in some fashion. You're a storyteller. That's something that you're passionate mm -hmm. about um, in general, whether it's yours or other folks and, and, or the Greek gods, apparently, as we found out, uh, which I'm very <laughs> excited for um, when, when you're trying to, trying to do that, that is what we need to do is tell our stories because it gives us the chance for someone to relate to us, for someone to understand our perspective or see themselves in our path or see themselves in our in our process so i love that that's what your life is become focused about and and i think your your mission has become focused about cool do your business make all that stuff happen but i love that that's where your heart is in in yeah. finding stories and telling them it's it's yeah, near and dear to ours as well so yeah i can definitely appreciate that so thank you well, awesome. Do not do not leave because we have to ask you our final question, as yeah. John said, which is um, what you want the Pebbles, our wonderful uh, listeners here in the Gravel Lot, to take home with them. Um, but we have to do the unfortunate part of this uh, uh, this capitalist hellscape we live in. No, them. I love ad, it's ad read time. This is it's like ad read this time. Is fun time. John's favorite time. Um, first of all, how pebbles? many people don't have the opportunity to have 
sponsors and advertisers because that's true that's true we are guys, very, that's an we are opportunity very, we are very very lucky and actually we do view all of these fine folks as our friends they are amazing people they've been with us since very early on um pebbles please go support them because they make this happen they allow us to um, pad our basements so if we need a room we can scream <laughs> in and no one can hear us i like how that's how you describe it now it went from it went from acoustic foam to now it's it's a padded basement it it's basically is it's a, it's a padded room in the basement where <laughs> I can lock myself in and make as much noise as necessary in order to get all of my frustration. That's out. how you prep nice. for the unknown dog. That's that's how you're <laughs> right. prepping yeah, for it. Exactly. Nice. <laughs> so first this week and a huge thanks to Adam and all the folks over at Be Free Ride Bikes Apparel. If you do not know Be Free Ride Bikes Apparel, you have not been apparently listening to our ad read. Um BFRB is amazing, has helped us out for a number of years now, making custom apparel for you and all of your cycling team or your buddies or whatever project you're working on. If you need something custom or you just want to buy some of their off the rack, uh, awesome gangster clothes um, that I wore yesterday on my ride, um, you can do that at BFRB.com, cycling.com. Um, if you want to get custom kit with custom sleeve lengths and custom chamois and whatever you need specifically, focused on your needs you can do that head on over to bfrbcycling.com and see how you can get yourself outfitted for this beautiful summer we're about to have and if you are a cyclist there's probably like in the ved diagram of like cyclist not cyclist there's it, it, it's basically a circle if you like coffee pretty so sure mostly. If, whether it's it's caffeinated or decaf we got you covered head to grimperbrothers.com now uh, get your hands on premium roasted coffee that is done in small batches. But even more importantly, it goes to supporting great causes. Head to the website now. Go look at all of the different blends and read through the paragraphs. Actually read through the paragraphs as to what those specific bags of coffee are going to support. Because an actual big chunk of the, the margin goes to supporting that specific cause. So no matter what it is, if it's getting juniors into races, if it's supporting trans athletes, if it's supporting female athletes, no matter what it is, go read about it. Figure out which one is your Venn diagram of your blend versus caffeinated, decaffeinated versus the cause that you believe in. Go there, check it out, support a great small business that's based out of Austin, Texas that supports this show. So we love Dan. We love everything that he's doing. It just so happens to be that he makes amazing coffee. So and he hand writes notes on every single package, so you're definitely getting love with each and every bag. Indeed. And if you sign up for the subscription service, that you will, I think it's you get 13 bags in a year for for paying for 12, so you get a free bag of coffee. So there's nothing. The only thing better than good coffee is free coffee that's good. So go do it, GrumperBrothers.com. Makes excellent sense. And last but not least, our friends over at Hand Up Gloves, the entire team over there is doing yeoman's work at keeping you looking fresh. Uh, whether you are... The never-ending uh, spring launch, I think. Yeah, the never-ending like spring the launch. the spring launch that just keeps going. It's like on it week four amazing. now. Like, seriously, the problem is, is I'm trying to downsize over here because right. I need closet space because I'm bringing another human into this house and it has crap, apparently. <laughs> Uh, oh, it's, it's going to have lots of crap, dog. Gonna, yeah, but apparently. <laughs> you're going to get to learn that, Uncle John. Come on down. Come on down. The crap factory over here on Wetzel. Um, but we are going to uh, try to downsize and get stuff out of the closet. And I'm like, holy hell. I want to buy all this hand up stuff. Can't yeah. do it. I can't. I just, I got to hold myself back, but you don't have to pebbles. You can go buy all the hand up stuff because you have big empty closets that need new gear, whether it is snow sports, uh, golf, because that season's here, um, or cycling, which we all love. You can get yourself yes. outfitted to represent the way you, uh, enjoy life. Yeah. John, you're going to yeah. say something. Yeah. No, what? no. I'm just getting yeah. ready to finish. That's all. Oh, okay. You're just zero. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready to hit my marks. You're, you're ready. Hit your marks. Hit yeah. your marks, John. Turn in when you need to. But go check out Hand Up Gloves. They're amazing. They've got awesome apparel to suit you and your personality, whether it's on the bike, golf, or snow sports, whatever. They've got it all. Go check them out at handupgloves.com. But also, if you really want to save money, go right now into our show notes and click the link there, and you'll get there and save yourself 10% on everything in store when you use code Pebble dollar sign. I do, think I'm, I do think I'm going to use that and, and buy some more flannels. I need to, I need, yeah, it seems Stock like it's, up before yeah, 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 I think it's time. 
I've, I've had the same ones for a while. Anyway. Perfect. So anyways, as always, a huge, huge thank you to all of you, the pebbles in the gravel lot. Old, new, we love all of you. We love hearing from all of you. Um, and we definitely, as we say in the intro, we cannot continue to do this thing without your support. So be sure to go visit, subscribe to all of our social feeds, go hit up the gravelot.com, check out all of the shows that are there. Um, Girls Moving Mountains back up for season two. They're, they're starting to put out episodes every two weeks, just like us. Stay in touch, stay up to date, learn how to become a Patreon supporter. Maybe give us a few bucks, buy us a cup of coffee. Um, just, t- just say thanks. Um, that stuff means the world to us because... Obviously, this costs money. All the hosting, all of those things cost money. Building Doug a padded room um, costs money. So um, (laughs) hit us up on Patreon. We'd love it. If not, just send us your thoughts. Send us your comments, no matter where it is, whether it's on social media or on the website. Hit up the contact form, all of those things. You guys know how to get a hold of us. Um, We stream our lives every other Tuesday, 6.30 p.m. Eastern. What is it? Daylight time now? Whatever it is. Is that like forever Um, or does that start next year? Probably is. Like they, starting they in 23 started. Okay. 23. Okay. Yeah. Cause, okay. cause there's so much going on in the world that they needed to uh, like pass a law all. about that right now. Yeah. Any, anyway, um, <laughs> Prior, face, Facebook, yeah. stream Prior. labs, Twitter, uh, YouTube live stream, go hit up all those things. If you're not a subscriber on YouTube yet, hit us up there. Cause then you can watch every episode and you can actually be part of the chat. So do all of those things. Uh, our new intro and outro music is from Water. Uh, excellent stuff. Uh, new jams dropping from him all the time. Um, thank him for that by going and downloading his stuff and sharing it out um, wherever you can. You can get the full length version of our intro outro song songs, which are excellent, and we are very thankful to him for all the fine music. So, uh, David, we've belabored that piece of things, which is necessary business, um, but we always like to close on on. One final question. That's what do you want the Pebbles, our fine, valiant listeners, to take home with them from this conversation we've had? And hopefully this is the first conversation of many um, as we do, as we figure out all of our lives together. Yeah, let's do it. Well, well, first of all, what we failed to get to because we just there's just not time, just not enough time for everything is in between each one of the 15 stories is the narrative of my 4,700 mile, 45 oh, that minor of thing. bike ride. That's true. So you there is, there is, I've, I've had people read the book and they go, Oh my God, it's the, it's the narrative of the bike ride in between. That's the best. Cause I talk about the people I meet and it's, it's not, it's not repetitive and boring. It's pretty cool. So if you're, if you're a, a, a fan of Epic cyclist cycling or endurance events, that, that thing is there, but I'd say that you did, we we buried the lead very hard. I know. I, I love hard. I love how we intro and we're like, this is the this is the best podcast about bikes on the internet, and then we just don't talk about bikes oh, for bikes. an hour and forty five minutes. That's hilarious. Yeah, well, that's nice. That's so that. yeah, I'll go buy David's book because it's about. <laughs> <laughs> It is cycle of life, so it does have cycle in yeah, it. Yeah. Hey. Sure. Well, at least we hit that mark, David, for sure. Here's the biggest nugget I learned. And I didn't learn it on the bike. I learned it actually on rollerblades. And I, I did a 85 mile, 87 mile rollerblade race from Athens, Georgia to Atlanta, Georgia. Ooh, that sounds fun. Yeah, on rollerblades. And I'm the least coordinated person you guys have ever met. So <laughs> you can pedal a bike and run and swim. I think you're okay, Coordinate. No, I'm, I'm okay, at, 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 but put me on rollerblades and forget about it. So I did this 87 mile race that I had no business doing. And I learned the key. To, well, for me, key to my life, I learned the key to it on this, on this rollerblade race. So um, if it resonates with you, it's going to stick with you, this visual. So I'm, I, I take off, I'm, I'm doing whatever I'm doing. Everybody, I'm the last, I'm definitely the last person. There's no question about it. And I see the sag wagon in the background. I don't even know what a sag wagon is at that point. I have no business doing endurance athletics because I'm completely out of shape. I'm unprepared. I know nothing about what I'm supposed to be doing. And about 30 miles into this 87 mile ride, I'm looking up this hill, they call it heartbreak hill. And I know why, because it's, it's a hill. It's like a massive mountain that you got to rollerblade up and then when you get to the other side you got to try not to die going down and oh, about a third of the way up this hill i'm toast i'm i'm literally done i have no business being there my legs are frozen i'm depleted of everything i could have i'm it's like 87 85 88 degrees out high humidity in atlanta and it's just it's miserable and i lean over perpendicular to the road i'm i'm putting my hands on my knees 
Um, and I look down and I'm just ready to pack it up and, and let the sag wagon get me. And I see this little line of sweat just starting to form from dripping because I'm just completely done. And I just had this thought. I go, dude, all right, so here, you got two options. One, you could just go home and you're going to know everything about yourself. That's it. Done. Might as well pack it up, go home. You know everything about yourself. You don't have to learn anything else because you already know everything you're made of. Or you could just figure out a way to take one more step and then one more step and then one more. And every single step is going to be something you're going to learn and about yourself or about the environment or how you interact with the environment or whatever. And I started getting this quest of like, ha, huh, I can learn. Like, I, like, this is not difficult. This is a learning experience. This is not miserable. This is a learning experience. And I eventually took a step. And I stayed ahead of the sag wagon. I made it another six hours somehow. I don't know how, but I got across the finish line and I'll never forget the visual of that line going. Every time I try something that I think I've already given it everything. It's like, no, no, no. Just take one more step. You're going to learn something. Take one take. Sometimes you got to learn. It's time to quit, but whatever you're going to learn, you're going to learn. So I guess that's, if that's the nugget or the pebble in my shoe for me, it's like optimistic that every Every new thing is going to teach me something. It's the same as putting your feet on the floor every day. Yeah. Right. Same thing. But, but yeah, just, I mean, and that day you may learn you need to take a nap and that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. And that's okay. Yeah. But you got to put them on the floor every day. If you don't, yeah. you're not showing up. And that I think is very, very valuable. I love that as a takeaway. That's excellent. Cool. David, this has been absolutely an, a, a massive pleasure for us. Um, thank you for taking the time to be here with us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate you guys and keep doing what you're doing. It's awesome stuff. I'm going to um, go get some custom gear made because I got a couple of epic rides coming up and I need we to will, be comfortable. We will, get you, we will get you with Adam and yes. we'll talk chamois options. Yes. He's got all the stuff. He's got all the cool stuff for sure. Nice. I love that. Thank you. And uh, keep doing what you're doing. I appreciate your guys' time. Well, thanks for being here. Pebbles, um, that's all for this week. So be sure to subscribe, follow, and engage because, as you know, decisions and trails are made by those who show up. So if we don't see you on the trails this week, we will see you next time. Bye, John. Bye, Doug. Thank you.